President Oaks, my fellow students of the Brigham Young University, I'm very grateful to have this privilege, I esteem it an honor, of worshiping and meeting with you in this first devotional of 1972. And I desire sincerely that I may have the Spirit of the Lord guide and direct and give utterance uh, with reference to some things that I have in mind saying on this occasion. I've sought the Lord in prayer, desiring devoutly to know what ought to be said. I feel led and uh, secure in my mind as to what subject should be considered, and I need guidance in choosing the proper language and expressing the thoughts that uh, are appropriate in this field. And as I pray for myself, I do so for you also that your hearts may be opened and your minds enlightened by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that you may know of the truth and divinity of the doctrine taught and the expressions made. I have taken the subject, Where is the Lord God of Joseph Smith? And I choose this from an Old Testament context. You will recall that Elijah the prophet was one of the mightiest and noblest of all who bore that title in ancient Israel. For three thousand years, instead of speaking of him as a prophet, he's always been known as the prophet. He went about doing miracles and works that are incomparable. Numerous occasions on which he called down fire from heaven. He sealed the heavens for three and a half years that there was no rain in Israel. He raised the dead. Uh, he had the gifts of the Spirit and manifest the prophetic power in the things that he did. And finally, he was translated and taken up into heaven without tasting death. His companion, his associate, was Elijah, was Elisha. And when the prophet Elijah ascended, the mantle fell on Elisha. And the first thing that he did was to take the mantle, literally the clothing that had been worn, and go to the Jordan River and smite the river and say, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And immediately the waters of the river parted, and Elisha walked over on dry ground. And then he proceeded on a ministry of miracles and signs and wonders that compared favorably with that of his master before him, he even also raising the dead. Well, the point I wish to take from this is that miracles and faith go together, and that Elijah worshipped the Lord and had that power and understanding of priesthood things and spiritual things, so that he, through his life and through his ministry, manifest the power of God among the people. And then his successor, Elisha, worshipping the same God and having the same faith, proceeded to do precisely, in principle, the same things. Now I say, where is the Lord God of Joseph Smith? Here we have the great prophet of the latter dispensation, who saw angels, received visions, uh, had uh, miracles performed under his ministry in great number, and in due course, was called home to his eternal reward. He laid the foundation. He taught the doctrine. Uh, he gave us what we need to know to chart our course toward eternal life in this final dispensation. Uh, one of the things that he said was this, God will not reveal anything to Joseph, that he will not reveal unto the twelve, 
and to the least and last saint as soon as he is able to bear it. Now I ask, are we walking in the path that Joseph Smith trod? Are we receiving the revelations and the visions and working the miracles, doing the things that he did? And if we are not, to the full measure that we should, well might we ask ourselves, where is the Lord God of Joseph Smith? Now, there isn't any question, and I don't want to be understood, to have indicated that the miracles and signs have ceased. They're with us. This is God's kingdom. There isn't the slightest question or doubt about that. The sick are healed and the dead are raised. The eyes of the blind are opened as much today as they were during the ministry of Joseph Smith. But I do think that this is more limited in the sense that it has not spread out among the generality of people in the Church as fully as ought to be the case. And so I'd like, in appropriately chosen language, if I may so be led, to raise some questions about this and to make some expressions that will chart a course and indicate what we have to believe and what we have to do if we're going to have in our lives in full measure the spirit and power of the religion that God has given us in this day. Now when we talk about the nature and kind of being that God is, we start out with the proposition that it is life eternal to know him, that he is known by revelation. There's no other way. He isn't found by research in the laboratory in a test tube. God stands revealed or he remains forever unknown. Now that is one principle. And if I may be so led, I'd like to teach and testify that there is a God in heaven who is everlasting and eternal, who's infinite in all his powers and attributes, who has all wisdom, all knowledge, all might, all power, and all dominion, and that he has given us the way and the means to advance and progress and become like him. Now the second principle I'd like to have before us as we start is what the Lord said to Joseph Smith. This generation shall have my word through you. And what this means is that if we're going to receive the knowledge of God, the knowledge of truth, the knowledge of salvation, and know the things that we must do to work out our salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord, it's going to come in and through Joseph Smith and in no other way. He's the agent and the representative, the instrumentality that the Lord has appointed to give the truth about himself and his laws to all men in all the world in this age. And so with that concept before us and taking the subject, where is the Lord God of Joseph Smith, let me read you a few quotations from the prophet which are definitive in nature, which reveal the nature and kind of being that we worship. Now, of course, we're all acquainted with the first vision, where the prophet saw the Father and the Son standing above him in a pillar of light, holy beings, personages who defied description because of the glory and grandeur that attended them. We're aware of the fact that they're personal beings. Uh, this first vision is the beginning of the knowledge of God in this dispensation. And in just a few moments of opening of the heavens, the Lord swept away all of the false concepts, the apostasy, the cobwebs of the past. And once again, there was one man on earth that knew that God was a personal being in whose image man is created. Now, all of us are well acquainted with this proposition. We start out there and we have no trouble. 
That's the beginning of the revelation of the knowledge of God in our day. And then all of us are somewhat familiar with the crowning revelations and pronouncements that Joseph Smith made about deity. These were made in two sermons, one on the sixth day of April in 1844, the King Follett sermon, and the second on the 16th day of June in 1844, just 11 days before he went to a martyr's death. And these statements in the King Follett sermon uh, are the ones that give us a little trouble. Uh, the pronouncements, the vision, the glory, the truth revealed in the first vision, in effect, uh, by way of illustration, is giving us some arithmetic. It's teaching us some basic fundamental things. And when we come to these crowning concluding weeks of the prophet's life, the knowledge that he gives us about God is in the realm of calculus. And our problem is that we take this calculus and have a little view about it, and it gets us sometimes out of perspective so that we don't recognize and understand and know the import of all the algebra and geometry and fundamental principles that intervened and were taught between the time of the first vision and the crowning pronouncements. Now in the uh, King Follett sermon, the prophet said, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today and the great God who holds this world in its orbit and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power was to make himself visible. I say if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man. For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God and received instruction from and walked, talked, and conversed with him as one man talks and communes with another. And then another sentence. I am going to tell you how God came to be God. And here's where our problems start. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another, and that he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the Father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did, and I will show it from the Bible, which he then proceeds with some great insight to do. Here then is eternal life to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests of God, the same as all gods have done before you, namely by going from one small degree to another and from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation, until you attain to the resurrection of the dead, and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings and to sit in glory, as do those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. Now this is true, it's eternal truth, to that King Follett sermon on the one given the 16th of June. The prophet added the concept that there were exalted beings above each other everlastingly. Well, let's not dwell on that until we can put it in perspective. Let's go back and pick up the great reservoir of eternal truth that the prophet revealed about deity. And if we can comprehend it and envision what actually is, then this more mysterious or difficult thing that all of us are acquainted with, will fall into position and we'll discover that we have a view and a knowledge of deity 
that will prepare us for eternal life in his kingdom. Now these statements that I now read uh, were in part written by the prophet and in whole approved by him and taught by him in the school of the prophets. They're taken from the lectures on faith. And he says to begin with, we believe God is the only supreme governor and independent being in whom all fullness and perfection dwell, who is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, without beginning of days or end of life, and that in him every good gift and every good principle dwell, and that he is the father of lights, in him the principle of faith dwells independently, and he is the object in whom the faith of all other rational and accountable beings centers for life and salvation. Now I take a second one. And this second, in effect, is a creed announcing what deity is. And in my judgment, it's the most comprehensive, intelligent, inspired utterance that now exists in the English language, that exists in one place, place, defining, interpreting, expounding, announcing, and testifying what kind of a being God is. It was written by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the spirit of inspiration, and it's in effect eternal scripture. It's true. I'll only read part of it, uh, and even then, because of the deep content that is involved in the words, we can't measure or fathom their full intent. We need to study and ponder and analyze the expressions that are made. The prophet says, There are two personages who constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things by whom all things were created and made, that are created and made, whether visible or invisible, whether in heaven, on earth, or in the earth, under the earth, or throughout the immensity of space. Now let's, to begin with, get the concept that God Almighty created and upholds all things. And when we say all things, we speak of the universe. There is nothing exempt. Doesn't this remind you of the language that Enoch used when talking to the Lord? He said, If it were possible to number the particles of the earth, yea, millions of earths like this, it would not be a beginning to the number of thy creations, and thy curtains are stretched out still. Let's get a concept instilled in our mind that God is omnipotent, that he is above all things, that the very universe itself is his creation and is subject to him, that he upholds and preserves and governs it. And now continuing, they are the Father and the Son. The Father, being a personage of spirit, glory, and power, possessing all perfection and fullness. The Son, who was in the bosom of the Father, a personage of tabernacle. He is also the express image and likeness of the personage of the Father, possessing all the fullness of the Father, or the same fullness with the Father. And he being the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and having overcome, received a fullness of the glory of the Father, possessing the same mind with the Father, which mind is the Holy Spirit, that bears record of the Father and the Son. And these three are one. Or in other words, these three constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things, by whom all things were created and made that were created and made, 
And these three constitute the Godhead and are one. The Father and the Son possessing the same mind, the same wisdom, glory, power, and fullness, filling all in all. The Son being filled with the fullness of the mind, glory, and power, or in other words, the spirit, glory, and power of the Father, possessing all knowledge and glory and the same kingdom, sitting at the right hand of power in the express image and likeness of the Father, mediator for man being filled with the fullness of the mind of the Father, or in other words, the Spirit of the Father, which Spirit is shed forth upon all who believe on his name and keep his commandments. Now the concluding part of this great creedal statement is the one that announces that we, fallible, weak, mortal men, subject to all of the ills and difficulties and vicissitudes of life, have power to advance and progress and become like our exalted and eternal Father and like his beloved Son. And these next words, in effect, are the same doctrine uh, that concludes, as God now is, man may become. This thing was announced in principle uh, way back in the school of the prophets and didn't have to wait for a King Follett sermon, although I suppose the saints didn't fully grasp what was involved in this language initially. Uh, but here it is. And all those who keep his commandments shall grow up from grace to grace and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, possessing the same mind, being transformed into the same image or likeness, even the express image of him who fills all in all, being filled with the fullness of his glory and become one in him, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Now, does that remind you of what John said, or what the Lord said to John, about those who overcome, uh, that they will sit with him in his throne, even as he also overcame and set down with, is set down with his Father in his throne? Does that remind you of what the resurrected Lord Jesus said to certain Nephites? Ye shall be even as I am, and I am even as the Father, and the Father and I are one. May I say that the whole purpose involved in the mind of God in revealing what kind of a being he is is to enable us, his children, to chart a course and pursue it with fidelity and devotion that will lead us to the same state of power and dominion and eminence that he possesses. The whole purpose and thrust of the plan of salvation is to enable us to advance and progress and become like God and the beginning of that advancement, the beginning of that eternal progression, is a knowledge of the nature and kind of beings whom we worship. Now, with that much basic fundamental before, <coughs> before us, let me take up a little of the detail that is involved in the prophet's presentation of the nature and kind of being that God is, the principles out of which faith in God grow, and without which faith cannot be perfected, and therefore without which no man can make the advancement and progression of which I speak, the advancement that leads to an eternal fullness in the presence of God our Heavenly Father. Three things are necessary, the prophet says, in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. 
First, the idea that he actually exists. There's no problem with us on that. That's the first vision. Secondly, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. Three things. We have a little problem, some of us, here. Thirdly, an actual knowledge that the course of life which he is pursuing is according to his will. And I guess if there's any field where we fall short, that's it. Uh, some of us don't so live that we can get in our heart the assurance, born of the Spirit, that the course we are pursuing accords with divine standards. But now let's look at these three things, the character, perfections, and attributes of deity. And in the prophet's language, here is God's character. We learn the following things respecting the character of God. First, that he was God before the world was created, and the same God that he was after it was created. Secondly, that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in goodness, and that he was so from everlasting and will be to everlasting. Thirdly, that he changes not, neither is there variableness with him, but that he is the same from everlasting to everlasting, being the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his course is one eternal round without variation. Fourthly, that he is a God of truth and cannot lie. Fifthly, that he is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted of him. Sixthly, that he is love. Those six things, the character of God. And as I say, there's so much meat in what is here expressed that we're not catching it by the mere recitation. We need to read it and study it and ponder it, and as we do so, get on our knees and ask the Lord for enlightenment and understanding so that we can know in our hearts and in our souls uh, if it is true and what is meant by the expressions that the prophet used. Now here's a, a sentence from him, a paragraph as to why God must be all-powerful. An acquaintance with these attributes in the divine character is essentially necessary in order that the faith of any rational being can center in him for life and salvation. For if he did not in the first instance believe him to be God, that is, the creator and upholder of all things, he could not center his faith in him for life and salvation for fear there should be one greater than he who would thwart all his plans, and he, like the gods of the heathens, would be unable to fulfill his promises. But seeing he is God over all, from everlasting to everlasting, the creator and upholder of all things, no such fear can exist in the minds of those who put their trust in him, so that in this respect their faith can be without wavering. Now, I'm digesting a great deal of material. Let me come to the attributes of God, and they're named simply as these, six in number. Knowledge, faith or power, justice, judgment, mercy, and truth. And then a statement illustrative of what's involved. Uh, this one, the prophet's explanation of why God must know all things. Without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures. For it is by reason of the knowledge which he has of all things, from the beginning to the end, that enables him to give that understanding to his creatures by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, 
it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him. Now just one word about the perfections of God. The prophet said, what we mean by perfections is the perfections which belong to all the attributes of his nature. In other words, where every attribute and every characteristic is concerned, the Lord is perfect and in him is embodied the totality of whatever is involved. Can anyone suppose that God does not have all charity, that he falls short in integrity or in honesty, or that there is any truth that he does not know? Uh, there's a statement in our literature that says that the prophet and his associates learned by translating the papyrus received from the catacombs of Egypt that life had been going on in this system for 2,555,000,000 years. Now it seems a reasonable thing to me that a God who has been creating and expanding and governing and regulating worlds for a period that is so infinite that you and I have no way of comprehending its duration, has attained to that state where he knows all things and nothing is withheld. Now, I haven't taken occasion to read any of the revelations. The revelations abound in these principles. They announce over and over again, if we comprehend and understand them, that God is almighty that there is no power he does not possess, no wisdom that does not reside in him, no infinite expanse of space or duration of time where his influence and power is not felt. There is nothing that the Lord God takes into his heart to do that he cannot do. He's attained to a state of glory and perfection where he is, where he is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, to be from everlasting to everlasting the same unchangeable, invarying being means, in effect, that he's from one pre-existence to the next. He's from one eternity to the next the same in knowledge, in power, in might, and in dominion. And yet he became such on the same system that you and I have power so to attain. And our revelations, and it's written expressly in them, say that if we advance and go forward in full measure according to the divine plan, we also shall receive a fullness and a continuations of the seeds forever and ever. Then shall they be gods because they have no end. Therefore shall they be from everlasting to everlasting because they continue. Then shall they be above all because all things are subject unto them. Then shall they be gods because they have all power and the angels are subject unto them. Well, I'm simply announcing as it were a few very basic and fundamental eternal truths about the nature and kind of being that we worship. Now, it's my pattern and custom simply to teach and testify. I do not debate and I do not argue. If someone wants to contend to the contrary, they're just as welcome as the day is long to do so. But let's have this straight. When we get dealing with God and his laws, when we get in the realm of spiritual things, we're dealing with the things that save souls. And at our peril, we're obligated to find the truth. The whole sectarian world sits out here and they suppose that they have some truth and that they're pursuing a course that will save them. But God has restored the everlasting gospel to us. And we have the power of God unto salvation in our hands as it were. Now it's our obligation to come to an understanding of what is involved so that we will be in a position 
to live in such a manner that the fullness of these blessings and rewards will come to us. And so I'm bold to testify. I've tried to teach in a very brief manner here today some things which you can explore in more amplified form at your leisure. But I am bold to testify that these doctrines are true, that God is all that the revelations say that he is, that there's no power, no might, no omnipotence that excels him, and that if you and I will advance and progress and pursue the course that he's made available for us, we can attain that state where we will be from everlasting to everlasting. And then as these revelations recite, we will know all things and have all power, and we will go on eternally in the same type and kind of existence that he lives. The name of the life that God our Heavenly Father lives is eternal life. Eternal is the name of deity. We say eternal life is God's life. That's the same thing as saying God's life is eternal life. If we can so obtain, we will be like him and be one with the Father and the Son within the meaning of this great creedal statement that I've read here this morning. Now, I happen to know that this work is true. We're engaged in the Lord's work. This Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the kingdom of God on earth, and it's been organized and set up as the place where the truths of salvation may be found and taught and heralded to the world. And there's something about testimony that all of us ought to know. It's one thing to bear testimony to the truth and divinity of the work. But we don't perfect our testimonies until we get to the point where we can bear witness that the doctrine we proclaim and that the truths we have taught are the mind and will and voice of the Lord, that they're eternally true. Now, no man can do that, of course, unless he gets into a position where he speaks by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, there isn't any question or any reservation in my mind as to what is here involved. And I can add to the testimony that I have of the truth and divinity of the work as such that these doctrines which the prophet here expounded and presented to the world are true, that they're the mind and voice and will of the Lord. And we don't have to be led astray by a misapprehension or a partial understanding of something that for the moment is over our heads, uh, and it's over our heads because we haven't learned the great body of residual truth. We haven't learned what's in the great reservoir of revelation that the Lord has given on this subject. The work is true, the doctrine is true, and all of us will stand before the judgment bar of the Almighty and be judged by the extent and manner and degree to which we have believed those things which have come to us through Joseph Smith. Where is the Lord God of Joseph Smith? The Lord God of Joseph Smith is just as available today as he's ever been. And just as assuredly as we center our hearts in him and believe in him with full purpose, we'll stand as Elisha stood with reference to Elijah. We'll stand where Joseph Smith stood, and we'll have the visions and receive the revelations and work the miracles and feel the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as he felt it in his which may God grant for all of us, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.